Hello, I'm Maria Hall Brown, and this is LA Currents. To live in Los Angeles means that you live with traffic. As a matter of fact, in 1929, the intersection of Wilshire and Western was claimed as the most busiest intersection in the world. Well, how much has changed? Actually, a lot. And I'm delighted to have someone here who can tell us all about it. The general manager of LADOT, Salida Reynolds. So nice to have you here. Thank you. So nice to be here. All right. Do we still claim the busiest intersection in the world at any point in Los Angeles? We definitely move. We claim that we have the intersection that moves the most cars. Oh. So Wilshire and Western is still one of the largest intersections that moves the most cars. And that's because we have this amazing system called ATSAC that was built for the 1984 Olympic Games. And if you are a transportation nerd, somebody who cares about <laughs> transportation and follows stories, ATSAC is legendary. It's one of these sort of um, crown jewels of uh, transportation and traffic management, and it still exists today. And it's actually, you know, for the 84 games, it started as just a, a small number of intersections, and now it manages an interconnected system of over 5,000 intersections in the city of Los Angeles and the county. So it is the largest and most sophisticated center of its kind in North America. And we, we invite people, we welcome people from all over the world who want to come see it, see how it operates. It's actually located in um, P4 underneath City Hall was where there used to be a, a fallout shelter actually down there. So it is extremely all that safe. Works. <laughs> yes, because if you've ever seen the movie The Italian Job, you've seen some some footage from ATSAC where in the movie um, they turn all of the, the signals green because they hack into ATSAC um, so that the, the thieves can um, stage their getaway. You cannot do that. It's uh, ATSAC is pretty unhackable because um, one of the benefits of being built with 1984 technology is that it's not in the cloud, it's not uh, on the internet, it's very hard um, to reach it. Uh, and we're actually in the middle of a huge project to relocate ATSAC um, over into some bigger quarters so that it can, it can grow. Because as ATSAC has grown up and the city has grown up, what we manage every day has become more complicated. There are trains and bikes and buses and all sorts of other things that we that we manage. Okay, so ATSAC is obviously an acronym for what? Automated Traffic Surveillance and Control. Okay. That's what it stands for. Okay, and it's literally monitoring how many vehicles are on surface streets and going through intersections within the city of Los Angeles. Oh, I mean, I actually, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. It's, it's, it's millions, it's in the millions. Um, because, you know, we have, it's a 24-7 operation. We have 7,500 miles of streets what? and alleys in the city of Los Angeles that LADOT manages and operates. And ATSAC, you know, manages each of those 5,000 intersections and the thousands of cars that, that go through them each and every day. Okay, so you actually just really led me into what I wanted to start off with, because I was sort of, I mean, I was I thought I was being funny about the intersection of, <laughs> of Wilshire and Western, but it was really fun to hear all about what's yeah. happening now. Um, you know, this is literally the second largest municipal transportation agency in the country. Yep. And the scope seems immense. Obviously, you just gave me a little bit of statistics in terms of, you know, how many miles. Yeah. But what are the fundamental responsibilities of LADOT? So the interesting thing about departments of transportation is that <clears throat> in different cities is that no two of them are really exactly the same. Okay. They, they, most of them grew up in their cities as their cities grew and some of them started out as public works agencies or started out in other places and then the city decided, wait a second, we actually need an entire department just for transportation. In fact, the city of Oakland um, just created a department of transportation in the recent past. So okay. there are still cities that are sort of, uh, you know, creating new departments. In LA, what that looks like is we manage and operate those 7,500 miles of streets, those 5,000 intersections. We also have a responsibility for parking. So we have 37,000 on and off street parking spaces and meters that we manage throughout the city. Some of them are structures, like in Hollywood. A lot of them are just uh, surface lots and then all of the on street metered parking. Okay. And then we also have LADOT Transit, which we're very proud of. We're the largest municipal transit operator in the county so we move about 20 million trips uh, on an on an in a in a normal year we move about 20 million trips um, on LADOT dash and commuter express 
and our uh, paratransit service as well, City Ride, that serves people with disabilities um, that need sort of special services to get them where they need to go. And then we also have a responsibility for regulating uh, different um, for hire and private transportation industries like taxis, um, scooters, and electric bikes that people around Los Angeles have seen and many cities have seen popping up um, everywhere throughout the city. So we have a really large portfolio of, uh, of responsibilities that we have. We're, we put all the signs on the street and the, and the striping on the street that you see, but we also have uh, partners over in Public Works. So there's five Public Works bureaus. We don't fill potholes. That's Streets LA. Uh, we don't manage the freeways. That's the state. That's Caltrans. And we don't run the subways and a lot of the um, surface transit. That's Metro. So the name of the game for us is really collaboration. We can't just sort of operate in a little silo because everything we do is connected to another agency um, and, or even sometimes another city or another level of government. And of course, Los Angeles, uh, just having the population it has, you know, commuter traffic is is, is core the to scale every is scale immense. is immense. Yeah. Okay, um, you brought up a very uh, pertinent word in the explanation, and that's parking. And obviously, during the pandemic, uh, the early days of the pandemic, and the safer at home orders, uh, Mayor Garcetti eliminated the uh, possibility of getting a parking ticket. Uh, for a number of places. Mm -hmm. Where are we right now? Are those meters now back functioning and can people get tickets if they uh, do not follow the signs that are posted in neighborhoods, et cetera? It's a really good question because, and it's very confusing in a city oh, like yes. Los Angeles, the <laughs> parking regulations are complicated and they change from block to block and sometimes even from parking space to parking space. Um, and so what at the very beginning of the pandemic, you know, LADOT also has a responsibility. We have uh, 600 parking enforcement traffic control officers who are out there every day directing traffic, writing parking tickets, their school crossing guards as well. Um, we, we perform those functions to keep the city moving. Uh, we also adjudicate those tickets. So if you get a ticket and you don't feel like we were fair in giving you that ticket, we have hearing officers and a whole process by which we uh, you know, hear people out when they think they haven't been ticketed fairly. At the beginning of the pandemic, it became really clear that you know, people were going to need to shelter in place. They were going to need they were, the safer at home orders went out. But not only that, but almost overnight, we had a lot of people in this city lose their jobs and you know either temporarily or permanently and as a department it felt like you know we have a lot of, of financial um, burdens that we put on people we write your ticket that ticket can increase um, in its in its you know an amount if you don't come in and, and tell us you think it was wrong so we did a few things first we stopped enforcing residential street sweeping so you know, the street sweeper comes by and that's a, you know, it's a common complaint in lots of parts of LA. Like, I'm on the wrong side of the street. You wake up and it's Wednesday and you're like, wait, is it the second yeah. Wednesday? Is it 10? Do I need to move my car? Um, and we do that because keeping the streets clean is a public health matter. Um, you want to keep garbage and trash and all sorts of other things that accumulate on streets out of the streets. We stopped writing those tickets. We kept writing tickets at meters, which okay. I think was confusing for people because it wasn't just an outright across the board freeze. But then we also stopped enforcing a whole bunch of other um, things that we enforce for. Uh, we, we almost completely stopped towing people, um, which is something that we do. And we stopped the, we froze your parking ticket. So if you had a parking ticket, we froze it so that it wouldn't continue to increase okay. if you didn't come in and pay it and figure it out. And then residential permit parking. We didn't write tickets for residential permit parking, which was another issue for people. So um, actually, it's a good question. On Monday of next week, we are taking, uh, at the request of the city council, we're taking back a report that lays out when, if and when and how we would resume parking enforcement. Because now that people are sort of moving around a little more, we're actually starting to get different kinds of concerns from people about the cleanliness of their streets. They really want them swept again. And the safer at home orders are, you know, have sort of, um, the way that people move around the city has changed. People are getting out and they're, they're you know, moving around the city. So. Um, we October 1st is potentially when we would resume 
all parking enforcement throughout the city. Okay. Um, but we're really excited about a couple of ideas that we have to make it easier on people. So we're proposing that if you have several parking tickets, um, you could have an amnesty where you could come in and just pay the base amount for those tickets um, and we'll wipe, a, wipe away all of the increases in fines and things like that. And a couple of other ideas to try and um, make it easier for people to ease the burden a little bit because we know that so many people are still struggling. Fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So other things that kind of uh, happened during the early days of the pandemic, you mentioned a lot of your um, ability to move people around with Dash and Commuter Express mm -hmm. and, and, and Land Now. So are those up operating again? Can people call a shuttle? Can people get those rideshare opportunities that LADOT offers? Yes. Okay. So Dash, which are all of the, you know, they're sort of neighborhood circulators. So there are several of them that move around downtown, and then we have them in neighborhoods throughout the city. Um, all We made all transit free at the beginning of the pandemic right. uh, because um, uh, both because we wanted to sort of lessen that burden on people, but also because we were protecting the transit operators themselves. So the people who sit at the front of the bus and, you know, operate the bus and move around town, we wanted to try and um, protect them as much as we could because actually in transit agencies around the United States, um, transit operators were getting hit really hard. There were many of them that were uh, getting COVID-19 and even uh, in New York City and, and Metro, um, you know, getting very ill and, and actually, you know, passing away um, from, that, from that disease. So to prevent the amount of interaction that the bus driver has when somebody comes in the front door and pays their fare, we made it all backdoor boarding so people only get on through the back um, and we have wheelchair ramps in the back so everybody can get in and out no matter what their needs are. We put masks on the buses so that if you don't have a mask, you can get one when you're on the bus for free um, and we made transit free. Uh, the only challenge that we have now is trying to figure out how to bring back some of the service that we scaled back. So Commuter Express especially because those services take people long distances and most of them run in the morning to get you to work and then in the evening to take you home. And when we, you know, we had a real drop off when everybody started, everybody who works nine to five or a lot of folks started working from home. Sure. So we haven't brought as much of the Commuter Express service back. Uh, but Dash, and in particular, the Pico Union line um, that services kind of the heart of the city, has continued to have a lot of people riding it and using it because these are frontline workers and people who don't own cars who, who rely on transit as kind of a lifeline. Right. So our plan is to keep transit free uh, at least until the end of the year. And um, hopefully at some point schools will be back in session. I know I have two... Uh, two daughters uh, in LA Unified uh, schools, and I'm really crossing my fingers along with a <laughs> lot of other You and every parents, other mother in the city. <laughs> that things become safe enough for both teachers and for kids that they can, they can go back. Um, but uh, uh, LADOT Transit actually is free for students and free for youth and has been for quite a while um, because we have a lot of kids that ride our buses to get to school. So sure. we're thinking about those things and planning for those things, and then in the meantime, trying to keep that service um, in a place where people feel safe because um, people are feeling a lot of anxiety and fear to get on public transit, especially in the beginning when there wasn't a lot of information about how the disease was transmitted and was it airborne and who could get it. Right. Um, so we limited the number of people actually who could be on each individual bus, and but then we increased the number of buses so you wouldn't get passed up. And right. we tracked that very carefully. How many riders did we end up having to pass with one bus? How much longer did they have to wait? And how much faster are our buses now that there isn't as much traffic? And what are some of the changes we can make to keep that service going and keep it really strong, even as traffic returns? Let's keep with this theme of adjustments made because of this shift in how we exist, period. Mm -hmm. So one of the big things in particular uh, before uh, when restaurants were allowed to open and then they were had to close again was the opportunity to create a dining al fresco. With that, restaurants had the opportunity to have guests again. Mm -hmm. And with that, 
parking spaces were taken away and lanes and streets were taken away. So I imagine it from your vantage point, great idea with maybe some challenges to consider. So where is that balance right now? Because, you know, it's great that we can dine outside uh, until the opportunity provides itself that we can go back in, which I think is going to be soon. But then you're yeah. losing some of your parking that is so precious here in the city and you're losing some of your lanes mm -hmm. which are so integral to the movement of traffic in the city. Yeah. So how's it all playing out? So I love the question because I think that it points to something that I think a lot of people uh, maybe don't think about which is that the streets in the city are public space, right? They belong in the sidewalks. They're just like a park or any a library, anything else that belongs to the people who live in that city. And my job is really just to manage that space for the public good while I'm in this position sort of holding the public trust. Right. And so when I think about all of the different ways that you could use a single parking space, I could use it to store a private vehicle, right? That's parking. I could use it, there are a lot of spaces around the city where we've taken, uh, we've turned those spaces into what we call bike corrals. So you can fit, you know, dozens of bikes in the same space that you can fit that one car. Um, and we had a program called People Street where businesses and neighborhoods could apply to Department of Transportation to convert their parking spaces into what we call parklets. So mm -hmm. little opportunities for, you know, whatever you wanted to, to sort of do in that space. When the pandemic began, almost overnight, we did something which was, uh, we asked businesses, would you like, uh, instead of a two hour parking space, would you like a 10 minute pick up and drop off zone? Because now, you are serving, you know, you've got delivery yeah. drivers right. and takeout happening. So can we use this space smarter and, and differently to meet your needs? Um, and we had hundreds of businesses throughout the city say, yes, we think that this is a, this is a, a choice that will help our business. And similarly, you know, when we saw, we saw that enormous positive support that we got for that, um, we decided to take it one step further and say, okay, well now, would you like to use the space in front of your business for outdoor dining or retail sales or street vending? Uh, we opened the program to street vendors as well. And we had almost 2,000 businesses around the city of Los Angeles apply to the program. Not every single one of those is a parking space removal. We've only done that in about 50 places. Okay. And then we've done a lane closure in so far two places. I hope uh, we'll see others. but. Um, that, uh, some of them were, were putting tables out onto the sidewalk. Some of them were putting tables out into parking lots that they owned that were private. And then others of them said, nope, we don't, we don't have space to do it on the sidewalk. We don't have our own parking space. We want to do something on the street um, that is, you know, that opens the street up for different purposes. And from my vantage point, you know, those small businesses in the city of Los Angeles they really make up um, all of the things about the city that we love, not just from an economic perspective, but Cultural. the culture and the vibrancy of those neighborhoods that they that they contribute to. You know, I'm I'm worried a little bit that some of those things about the city that make it special, that make it a place that you want to come back to over and over again, might not be able to survive. And so I feel like part of my job is to do everything I can and put my assets up to support those small businesses who employ, you know, lots of folks, uh, not as many as they used to, but they're still, you know, keeping folks uh, working. And um, I, I want to do as much as I can to support that. And so that's a, that is a balanced challenge. But the way that we went about it in asking businesses to tell us uh, what they wanted to do differently, I think helped with some of what you're getting at, which is really about, it's a trade-offs conversation. Sure. You know, and that trade-off, I bet if I had gone and asked those 50 businesses before the pandemic, hey, what would you think about me taking away a parking space to give you a parklet? <laughs> it would have seemed outlandish to them, you know, or, or some of them maybe. Um, but now it feels like, you know, yeah, obviously, of course, we, we're desperately, we need space and we want to use this for something different. And since it's public space, you know, 
I think we ought to let the public tell us, you know, how they want to do things differently and, and be supportive. Think some of those areas are going to be kept? I hope so. I think some of them are, um, actually I was just in Lamert Park uh, yesterday and there you have several businesses along a, a couple blocks that have decided, hey, we don't want to just think small and do one parking space. We want to do this entire corridor. And I think that that has the potential to um, really transform the way that that entire street feels and that that entire neighborhood feels. And I, I wonder if it won't be something that people love so much that they won't say, yeah, we ought to keep this because this space we see how much more this space could do. We see how much more it could mean to the businesses and the people in this neighborhood. Let's keep it. And then our challenge is to figure out, all right, well, no, how do we make it permanent? Park. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I love Lemmer Park. I think that's such a has such a great energy over there. All right, so let's move forward a little bit because I know one of the things that you brought to the table when you came is the ability to get around the city in um, new and, uh, you know, innovative ways, right. uh, scooters and bikes and electric car sharing and everything. Um, how are those programs going and how does LADOT work with, you know, making sure again a balance, yeah. scooters are great. It'll get you, you know, in a block in a very short period of time and then there's a scooter, mm -hmm. you know, and we've seen other cities like Nashville had to pull them off the streets for yeah. a while because there were a lot of problems in, right. in managing, managing. So how, are, how is it going here? So far, it has been um, a big learning opportunity for us. You know, some of the things that government can do well you know, manage a huge network of streets at scale and uh, build out these programs that uh, build out big infrastructure projects that take many, many years. That's what we're good at. We can kind of play the long game and we can have uh, policy goals that are about, you know, climate or public health or economic, you know, vitaliz revitalization. The private sector is really good at being very nimble, uh, being very quick, learning fast, and you know, coming up with new ideas and experimenting in a way that we can't always do in government. And so having those, if you ha have those two things working together, you can really open up a lot of great opportunities. But there's a natural tension there because private companies care about returning value to shareholders. And so they need to do things fast, they need to show value quickly, and sometimes the, the, the sort of values that they bring are some of those more values we might associate with Silicon Valley, that move fast and break things kind of approach. And that doesn't work on a, you know, a, a city sidewalk uh -huh. that is crowded already and that has you know, older adults that are trying to get to a bus stop and has you know, kids that are walking to school it's, you can't have a scooter that goes 15 miles an hour and being left in the middle of that sidewalk. So our approach has been, how can we set up the rules so that businesses feel like they can come to Los Angeles and be successful? I didn't want to put my thumb on the scale and restrict those ideas, but there needs to be a very strong uh, adult in the sandbox, let's say, making sure that everything is uh, kosher, everybody's playing well together, and that's our job. So we've created both uh, cre very creative regulations for those companies, and sometimes, in the case of EV car share, we actually have gone out and gotten grant money to invest in those systems so that we can make sure that they go to low-income communities and places where they might not go if we weren't involved because they may not, they may have, they may, those companies may feel like, um, you know, we're going to make a lot more money if we just start out in some of the wealthier parts of town. And that doesn't meet our goals. So how can we put our money where our mouth is and invest in those companies? So, so far, you know, especially during the pandemic, it's been a mixed bag. Um, you know, many of the scooter companies pulled their fleets off the streets at the beginning of the pandemic. They're kind of slowly coming back. We've actually had almost every scooter company that has been in Los Angeles um, has opted to continue to stay here. So we expect to see them start to slowly but surely redeploy. Um, our EV car sharing provider stopped service at the beginning of the pandemic and we worked with them to reopen service. Um, and now we're actually trying to go out and find more grant money to expand that program because both of those have actually been really meaningful in people's lives. 10 million rides on scooters and bikes, 
Um, over 60% of the people who are members of EV car sharing are low or very low income. So we're seeing that people really want these services and they're useful. And so now the challenge is how do we keep them going? Mm -hmm. And how do we make sure that, that they do it in a way that uh, works for everybody and respects everybody else who's using the streets and the sidewalk? We don't have a lot of time left, but it's fascinating because the dynamics of how a city exists shifts and there's there's more of an urbanization going on with Los mm -hmm. Angeles. Young people are moving into urban, more urban areas versus the suburban space, et cetera. And you spent quite a bit of time up in Los Angeles, I'm uh, sorry, San Francisco before you came to Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. um, They've got a huge public transit system there that is kind of incorporated into the world, including the trolleys. And at right. one point, Los Angeles had the red cars and the yellow cars and all mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. Are you, are you stealing ideas from, <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's a natural thing to do, yes. you know, where it works. And would we ever see a red and a yellow trolley car back again or things like that? Because we're shifting, we're changing. LA yeah. is a constantly uh, fluid environment. Yeah, I think so that's, we all, all cities, this is another way we're different from the private sector. We beg, borrow, and steal from each other all the time because a good idea is a good idea. And if that good idea originates in New York City or in Seattle or in Houston or in Singapore or in Paris, we want to try and, and bring those things that we think will work in Los Angeles to LA. And so San Francisco is another, is an example. We uh, we exchange, actually, we have a, um, a group of cities uh, that we ca that's called the California City Transportation Initiative, CACTI for short, which is, we think, appropriate for California. <laughs> um, and we get together frequently and we compare notes and we share resources and sometimes we work together if there are changes that we feel like would benefit all of us at the state level. So um, a lot of the biggest California cities are in included in that, including you know, everybody from Fresno to Sacramento to San Francisco to Long Beach to San Diego to Los Angeles. And we all have different needs. Um, but to your question, I think what one of the really exciting things that's happening right now in Los Angeles is that Metro is building out, uh, you know, one of the largest expansions of subway and light rail in North America, if not the world. And I was actually just on a call with my colleague in New York City, Polly Trottenberg, and she was saying, yeah, this is, we're very jealous. We look at Los Angeles and we see all of the investment and the construction um, in your system. And we, we, want, we want to do the same thing here in New York City. We want to have that same kind of investment in our subway system that's over 100 years old mm -hmm. um, and, you know, beginning to sort of to struggle a little bit. I think that the challenge right now for public transit, though, is an existential threat for, to its existence because much of um, public transit service, the funding for that service, has dried up or disappeared. And so San Francisco is, because a lot of it relies on sales tax revenue oh, sure. um, and other uh, gas tax revenue, other revenues that fall when the economy suffers. So San Francisco has cut back their service quite significantly. Um, and we're all working together to see if we can get some help from the federal government because in a lot of our cities, that public transit uh, service is really the secret ingredient that makes the city work, that makes it function. I mean, imagine those 20 million rides on LADOT transit turning into 20 million more cars uh, on the road. And, you know, it, you begin to really appreciate um, what an impact it, it makes and what an impact it can make um, for cities around the world. So we're really hopeful that uh, we'll see that, that reinvestment. We got an initial investment, but we need more um, so that Los Angeles can continue to sort of grow in the direction that, it, that it's moving, which I think is one that uh, feels like uh, the you know, forward progress to a lot of people. I started exploring the website obviously for us to have this conversation and it it is very vast and yes. there's a lot of fascinating information including the link to the history of the mm -hmm. uh, transportation in LA which of course is where I got some of my more fun news mm -hmm. so what is that website if people want to keep up on what's going on in their neighborhood and see what you're doing with um, LADOT LADOT.lacity.org awesome well I really appreciate all this who knew that talking about 
Transportation could be so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> I do it all the time. <laughs> Thanks, Alina. Thank you. And that's a wrap on this LA Current.